Hello everyone. Today, the context we are going to introduce is Orinoco, and these are our group member: Ellen, Charlotte, Effie, Ken, Maggie, and Rebecca. And this is our outline. First, we will have Ellen to introduce the background of the author and time. Then Maggie will summarize the story. Then Effie will analyze the three characters in this novel. Then we will have Rebecca to analyze the setting and the context. Charlotte will analyze the three major themes we quote. Then finally, Ken will compare and contrast Orinoco with Moore's Utopia by common social themes. Hello everyone. My name is Alan. Today I'm gonna introduce the author of Onoko, Eva Ben. Eva Ben. She was a she was born in 1640 and died in 1689, age 48. She's a woman of main talent. She worked as a novelist, dramatist, poet, and translator. According to record, most of them refer that she delivered obscure her births, including her parents. Ben is considered to be an important playwright in the 17th century theater, and her prose works are considered to be the development of British fiction. She overcame the cultural barriers, became the first English woman to earn her living by her writing, and also she's a literary role model for later generation of women writers. Here is a timeline of Eva Ben's life. I just want to briefly point out several twins in her life. In 1640s, she was born. She has a very mysterious birth. I will give more specific detail on the next page. In 1663, she encountered Orinoco, as known as the protagonist of this presentation. In 1664. She maybe maybe marry a Dutch or German businessman, and she died in next year. In 1667, she serves in Antwerp as a spy for Charles II. Antwerp is a port is a port in northern Belgium. In the next year, she was sent to prison for date, which she in. Occurred in the service of the crown, and 1670s is the years. It is, is the year of production of Ben's first play, *The Fourth Marriage*, at Lincoln's Inn Field by the Duke's Company, and she died in 1689. The birth of Eva Ben. As I mentioned before, she has a very mysterious birth. It is maybe she has deliberately obscured her early life. She was born during the build-up of English Civil War. I found three versions of her birth. One version of Ben's life tells that she was born to a barber named John Amis and his wife Amy, and another. Versions tell that Ben was born to a couple named Cooper. A book named *The Histories and Novels of the Late Ingenious Mrs. Benz* states that Ben was born to Bartholomew Just Johnson, a barber, and Elizabeth Dana, a wet nurse. In one of Ben's stories, said that she traveled with Johnson to Suriname in the 1650s, and during this trip, Ben says she met an an African slave leader named Onoko. This experience became the basis of her most most famous novel, Onoko. She returned to England in 1654 and married a businessman named Ben. Her wisdom and talent make her revered. The Second Anglo-Dutch War had broken out between England and Netherlands in 1665, and she was recruited as a political spy in Antwerp by King Charles II. This is first well-documented record of her activity activities we have known. It may be that she was never. Paid by the crown, so she went to prison for her date. 
and then she began to write to support her life. After she left prison, she started to write for one of theater which Charles II reconstructed, and her first play was produced in September of 1670. She became fam she became famous and successful writer of witty and comedy. Banks often used her writing to attack the preliminary British political party. One time, she under arrest by writing a poem of imperial family claimant to the throne, and Ben died on April 16, 1689. She was buried in the cloister at Westminster Abbey. Hello everyone, my name is Maggie, and I'm going to give you the summary of Afra Ben's Orinoco. Orinoco chronicles the story of the African prince and his beloved wife Imoida, who are captured by the British and brought to Suriname as slaves. The tale is set primarily in this locale on the northern coast of South America during the 1640s, just before the English surrendered the colony to the Dutch. And I divide the story into the six parts. Uh, the first part is the beginning of the story. The nameless narrator is a young English woman and resides on Perrin plantation, awaiting transportation back to England. She is the daughter of the new deputy governor, who unfortunately died. Before introducing the primary character, the narrator provides great detail about the colony and the inhabitants, presenting first a list of multicolored birds, myriad insects, uh, high color flora and exotic fauna. The narrator insists colonists live happily with the natives because of their vast numbers. The colonists are unable to enslave them and so must look elsewhere for slaves to work on the sugar plantations. And that is the reason why they look to Africa. The next one is Orunoko and Imoida. After her overview of Surina, the narrator switches the setting to Coramantian, on the west coast of Africa, where the protagonist, Orunoko, is about to meet Imo Imoida. The king of Coramantian is 100 years old, and he is Orunoko's grandfather. The king has also fallen in love with a young and beautiful Imoida, and he sends her the royal veil. The royal veil is a gift Imoida cannot refuse, which signifies that she is now the wife of the king. She will spend the rest of her days locked within the autumn. Only the king can visit. Arunoko's good friend Abang helps him break into the autumn. However, they fail. The king catches Abang, and Orinoco flees. After that, the king sells Imoida as slave, and declares that Imoida is dead. Next one is a fraudulent trading for Orinoco. Meanwhile, the British arrive in Coramantian to trade for the war captives. The captain invites the prince Orinoco and his friends to board his vessel as his guest. But then, surprised and takes them captive, soon after he promised Orinoco his freedom when he and his friend refuse to eat. But, he f but the captain fails to keep this promise. Upon the ship arrival at Surinan, Orinoco is sold to the mild-mannered and witty overseer of Perrin Plantation, who befriends him, Mr. Trifrey. At this point, Orinoco Oru meets the narrator, she and Trifrey assure the prince that as soon as the Lord Governor Willoughby arrives in Suriname, he will be set free. 
next is the marriage of Orunoko and Imoida. One day Orunoko working with Trifi, uh, suddenly he sees Imoida. The lovers fall happily into each other's arms and all but instantly marry. Soon Imoida becomes pregnant. Next one is the fear of Orunoko. At this point, Orunoko decides that his child not be born as a slave. Despite Trifi's and the narrator's renewed promises that all will be well when the governor arrives. Arunoko incites a slave revolt with the other plantation state slaves. They escape at Sunday night when the whites are drunk, but they leave a trail that is easy to follow. The plan is to settle a new community near the shore and find a ship on which to return to Africa. The last one is the death of Oroko and Imoida. Deputy Governor Bian negotiates with Oroko to surrender and promises him amnesty. Once more, he assures Oroko that he and his family will be freed and return to Africa. However, Bian lies once more to Oroko. He is whipped brutally with paper pulled into his wounds as soon as he surrenders. The despondent Onoko realized he, he now will never be free and that his child will be born in captivity. He informed Im Imoida that he has decided to kill her honorably, take revenge on Bian, and then kill himself. She thanks her husband for allowing her to die with di dignity, and he cuts her throat and removes her face with his knife. After Imoida's death, Onoko begins prostrate with grief and can never generate enough energy to go after Bian. Looking ever deeper into depression, he waits for a next to the body of his dead wife until the stench brings Bian's men to the site, where they immediately set about killing him. While they chop off his ears and one leg, Orinoco stands stoically, stoically smokes, then he falls down dead and then quarter his body before the housing of it. Hello everyone, this is Ivan, and in this part, I'm going to analyze the three characters in this novel. And first, we will have Arunoko. Arunoko is a South American prince, warrior, and protagonist of the story. He possesses all the quality of a prince. He is described as possessing distinctive quality of integrity, loyalty, morality, and strength that the narrator closely associated with European nobility. Besides, he has exceptional physical beauty, a broad and impressive European education. He is reverentially named Caesar upon his arrival in Suriname, and his action, even his look, are constantly linked to the most honorable Roman war heroes and deities. Ben described him as having European features and mentioned that his nose were rising and room. A Renoco's princely upbringing enabled him to see through the colonial system. He admires the Western value as he is influenced by a French tutor. However, um, the choice of what it means to be a slave hits him hard um, when he himself is taken as one. Arunoko's status, hunting skill, and the way in which he carries himself makes him, an, makes him an obvious candidate to lead the slave in revolt. In the entire story, Arunoko maintains his composure and dignity. Even in the end, he faces death bravely, showing no sign of agitation. But at Arunoko a hero? He loses his one true love to his own grandfather. He is captured and sold into slavery. 
Once in Suriname, he is unable to lead the slave rebellion, and he is eventually to kill his ch-、uh, little kill his wife, his unborn child, and ultimately himself in the fit of utter hopelessness toward his intractable position within the institution of slavery. In this way,、um, Arunoko becomes less an epic hero. And more than archetypal Shakespeare's tragic hero, a royal who possesses individual honor but is plagued by lust, revenge, and fatal directed courage that ultimately results in his own demise. And next character I'm going to introduce is Imoida. She is the main、um, female character in this novel. And she represents as well as define women's、uh, women's role in patriarchal society. Imelda is so is so into slavery after Arunoko attempts to rescue her from his grandfather's tomb, ah、uh, grandfather's altar. Clearly, it is her given slave name, and throughout the novel, she is known for her wondrous beauty. Imelda and Arunoko love each other and get married, but like Arunoko, Imelda dies in the novel to free herself from slavery. The narrator is unable to fully describe the depths of her splendor, because to describe her truly, one need only saying,、uh, she was female to the noble male. And the black Venus of delicate virtues. The idea of the、um, black Venus was popularized during the European colonization of Africa. In Europe, people were obsessed with the image、uh, of、uh, with the image of an over-sexualized African woman. Imelda is described to be the fairy king of the night. The narrator makes the point to note that she is not only appearing to Arunoko, but she has also captured the attention of white men. Imelda's physical appearance is also a curse in the story. The moral of the story seems to be that if a woman is too beautiful, she has、um, really relinquished any power that she could have had. Besides. It is because she is too lovely that Kim becomes obsessed with on her. Her beauty is seen as something to possess, and she is not more than a trophy, a trophy to any who have her, but even a Renoko. And the last character I'm going to introduce is the narrator. The narrator is the female English woman and possibly the. Direct voice of the author, Alfred Ben. She lived in Suriname for a while and may have the same, the similar experience to the author. And almost the whole of Arunoko is told in the narrator, uh, into the narrator's voice and from her perspective. And from most part, the narrator is open-minded. She sees this native as close descendants of. Um, Eden and Eve and Eva, before the fall of man, but her opinion toward Black Africans seems to be、um, a little bit murkier. But Arunoko is the exception. While the narrator abhors how Arunoko is treated, she never admits that she has a problem with the institution of slavery itself. The main injustice she describes is that. A nature king like Arunoko should not be treated as so、um, disrespectfully, and these are the analyses of the three characters. And next part we will have Rebecca to analyze the setting and the context. Hello, my name is Rebecca. Today I want to talk about analysis of the setting and the context of the task. The setting at the beginning of Arunoko. At the time, Suriname was a British colony. Kremantian was one of those places in which they found the most advantageous trading for these slaves. And I made some points. First, 
They built up slavery and colony from an editor. At the time in West, slaves were seen as a necessary economic component of Britain as colonial power. Not white people were treated as inferior in being enslaved. So the narrative clearly has no problem with the institution of slavery. The narrative makes the white colonial seems kind and tolerant towards the natives, in contrast to their treatment of black slaves. But the basis of this relationship is economic, as the colonies need to act friendly to keep trade going, and to continue making a profit of the natives. Then the narrator says, "Have all that is called beauty, except the color." The narrator always shows her bias toward non-European cultures, as she uses tra traditional white beauty as the standard to judge the natives. Treat them as they are not not fully human or deserving of respect. They are like children. The narrator describes Orinogos' intelligence, morality, and beauty. She suggests that Orinogos becomes so noble and admirable, admirable because of the Western influences of his education. Pointed out the language benefits Orinogo gain from it, in addition to the economic ones. Also, in some parts of the text. Afra Ben's political opinions appears in the narrator's claim that the king made a mistake in giving up the colony. Behind the narrator's admirations for the Shuriname lies the colonial agenda, which Ben herself supports. This agenda most mostly involves making money, even if that means brutally using natural resources and native people for English profit, predicts, and pleasure. Then I want to talk about Orinogo and Amoenda. The love between Orinogo and Amoenda is epic and almost supernaturally inspired, as Ben creates an exotic, exotic site. Sorry, as Ben creates an exotic site version of traditional Western hierarchy love stories. Orinogo's decision to take Amoenda as his only wife is portrayed as unusual in his country, proving that he's not a typical Corinthian man, but one who holds values similar to Westerns. The narrator ends her narrative by continuing, continuing to call Orinogo Kaiser, despite the title of the work and her claim to perceive. Preserve his gl glorious name, the name Imo Endo. On the other hand, the narrator uses consistently throughout, and even chooses at the last words of her work. Perhaps this is Ben's way of subtly commenting on the surprising differences between her hero and her heroine. Imo Endo, in some ways. Even braver and more content than Kaiser himself. Once again, Ben makes no effort to condemn slavery as a whole, but only disavows Kaiser's fate as a tragedy because he was no glorious and royal. Last one I want to talk about is the relationship between slavery and the colony. The English clearly, clearly have no real way of protecting their colony. The weapons they do have are mostly for show, and few are actually functioning. The poor condition of this weapon not only suggests that their authority has gone untested until now, but also their power over the slaves rests on empty threat, traditions, and fear. The native and slaves outnumber the English and have the mortal skills to defeat their oppressor. But they do not realize their advantages. The colonies are apparently divided on the issues of slavery, while some may be quite abolition, abolition, abolitionist. Most of Kaiser's friends hold an inconsistent view of slavery, believing that Kaiser should be free, but slavery itself is permissible. The Primates, on the other hand, are more consistent in their attitude towards slavery. They think that all black should be enslaved, including the royal Kaiser. Kaiser refers to as degenerates, those who would rather live as slaves than die in the pursuit of freedom. This is author 
uh, this is another kind of betrayal for Kajer and the reflection that uh, of the narrator's view that for some races, slavery and suburbans are only natural Kajer as exceptions, not the rule. Thank you for listening. Next will be Charlotte to make that three major themes in Aranogo. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Today I'm going to talk about three major things in Aranogo. The first one is it get our first parent before the fall. It seems as if they have no wishes. There being nothing to heighten curiosity, but all you can see, you can see at once, and every moment see, and where there is no novelty, there can be no curiosity. The importance here is that the narrator compares the indigenous people of Suriname to Eden and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Like then, the Surinamans go naked and no notion. Unlike our first parent, however, there is nothing to stimulate their curiosity. There is no tree of knowledge for Eve to eat from, and without curiosity, there can be no change, no innovation, and no civilization. The second one is, the second one is, and though they are all thus naked, if one lives forever among them, there is not to be seen an innocent action or glance, and being continually used to see one another so unadorned, so like our first parent before the fall, it seems as if they have no wishes, there be nothing to heighten curiosity. The importance of the set, the, the second paragraph is that. In this quote, in describing the natural innocence and freedom of the native of the West Indies, the narrator references the innocence of the biblical Aden and Eve, suggesting that the natives were as pure and free from corrupting knowledge as they were. The last paragraph. We are bought and sold like apes and monkeys to be the sport of women, fools and cowards, and the support of rock and wrong gate, and let have abandoned their own countries for rapid, murder, thief, and violence, and shall we render obedience to such a thing that? Degenerate race who have no human virtue left to distinguish them from the violence of creatures. The importance here is that in this time period, the Coromanti people were not uncivilized barbarians like the African, like the Africans described in the. Described in Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conant, the Coromanti people were multilingual, involved in trade, and far from primitive. They were not colonized or overtaken rather slave from the Gold Coast, were only obtained through war because of the slave trade. People that are taken were reduced to begin trade as animal. If these individuals were not taken in war, it would be abnormal to treat them this way. Modern pair and contrast Orinoco with Morse Utopia, and I'm going to talk about the common social themes and how do the two texts differ. So first, I'm going to talk about the common thing in Orinoco and Utopia. The one thing that these works shared is slavery. So slavery basically refers to any system in which principles of property law are applied to people, allowing individuals to own, buy, or sell other individuals as a juror form of property. A, f- a slave is unable to withdraw unilaterally from such an arrangement and works without remuneration. So basically, 
a person owns the other person and that person has to work for that person for free. Slave, slavery began to exist before written history in many cultures. So the work Utopia was published in the 15th century and the work Orinoco was published in the 17th century. However, um, a person could become enslaved from the time of their birth, capture or purchase even before any, you know, written history. So it, it, slavery has been existed for a long, long time, even before uh, the works, the respective works were published. So let's first take a look at slavery in Orinoco. Though to our modern sensibility, the answer is obvious that freedom is in, an inalienable human right. This wasn't so clear to Ben's 17th century British audience. British readers would already be accustomed to rigid social stratification, even amongst whites, because the whites have to obey to the kings and the queens, and would have generally assumed that slavery was an appropriate state for races they considered to be inferior, like Africans. Indeed, at that time, slavery was a common practice amongst whites and blacks alike, and Ornocle's transition from a slave owner to a slave himself attests to this historical occurrence. So, Ornocle is often interpreted as an anti-slavery novel because of the way the narrative describes the struggle, and Ben's work is highly contradictory in the sense that, although she breaks the Aristotelian models of writing fiction, she promotes Aristotle's idea of hierarchy and defense of an absolute monarchy. Ornocle as a whole shows Ben's contradictory stance on what is legitimate authority. Ben's novel is highly contradictory and has themes of obtaining an absolute monarchy contrasted with a sympathetic view on Ornocle, a noble slave. While breaking Aristotle novels, models of fiction, Ben encourages the philosopher's idea on democracy and hierarchy. Her novel is neither pro nor anti-slavery, as some suggest. It is simply a historical narrative meant to capture the complications of societal structures. So, so in Orinoco, um, the character Orinoco, as the title of the book, um, isn't a your ordinary slave. He is a noble slave in which he actually owned slaves and he was he has been one he has been a slave himself too so he is in a rather uh, volatile vo um, volatile position and um, the author of the book has um, used this character um, in order to portray um, the intricacy that of being empowered and and being being owned and and suggesting that uh, um, slavery is actually a neutral term in which um, one can enslave others and one can be enslaved by others regardless of um, not in the sense that um, a person is judged by the race, but in the sense that power and position given at birth and also race play into the factors of uh, being um, enslaved or to enslave others. So let's take a look at slavery in Utopia. So obviously, um, the only prisoners of war, the Utopians and slave, are those captured in wars. They fight themselves. The children of slaves are not automatically enslaved, nor are slaves obtained from foreign countries. Their slaves are either their own citizens and slaves for some he heinous offense, or else foreigners who were condemned to death in their own land. Most of the latter sorts. Sometimes utopians buy them at a very modest rate, more often they ask for them, get them for nothing, and bring them home in 
considerable numbers, both kinds of slaves are kept consistently at work and are always fettered, but the utopians deal with their own people more harshly than with the others, feeling that their crimes are worse and deserve stricter punishment because they had an excellent education and the best of moral training, yet still couldn't be restrained from wrongdoing. A third class of slaves consists of hardworking, penniless drudges from other nations who voluntarily choose to become slaves in Utopia. Such people are treated well, almost as well as citizens, except that they are given it at a little extra work, on the score that they are used to. If one of them wants to leave, which seldom happens, no obstacles are put in his way, nor is he sent off empty-handed. So, yeah, to put it simply, in Utopia, slaves cannot be bought, and nor can they be sold. Um, and they are usually captured in battles, and or they enslave people who have committed a horrible crime um, within Utopia, or committed crimes in other countries other than their land, and been condemned to death. Um, so, and the children of slaves are not born into slavery automatically. So let's take a look at the difference and the similarity between Ornopal and Utopia. So in Ornopal, slavery is inherent and destined at birth. In Utopia, slavery is an innate or inherent. In Ornopal, slaves can be bought or sold. Utopia, slaves cannot be bought or sold. In Ornopal, social classification hierarchy is emphasized. In Utopia, almost no social classification of hierarchy. In Orinoco and Utopia, um, that they are in common is that slavery exists, slavery through work captures, and slaves are treated differently in terms of labor based on a range of reasons. So thank you for listening. That is our presentation.